Hi there, it's Wendy Hernandez. Welcome to another episode of Command the Courtroom. And I'm really excited to share with you today another amazing guest. Today I have Rachel Grant. And Rachel's a sexual abuse recovery coach. You can find her at rachelgrantcoaching.com. And today we're going to talk about people who've experienced childhood abuse and they need a little assistance with communication, setting boundaries, and being assertive because of unresolved past trauma. And I know that this is going to help anybody who's watching this and who is trying to co-parent with an ex-partner. So Rachel, thank you so much. I'm happy to have you here. Oh, Wendy, it's such a pleasure to be here. Hello to everyone who's watching and listening. And I'm really just looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Rachel. So Rachel, just to give the viewers a little bit of background, would you be willing to share how you got into practicing in this area that you deal with right now? Yes, thank you. So um, my story really starts when I was five years old growing up in Oklahoma. Um, I uh, My grandfather came to live with our family at that time. And this was a great thing for me uh, because I really cherished him as a companion and a friend. And I look forward to like coming home and seeing him after school. My older brother and sister were kind of way older. <laughs> and so I was kind of like this only child, a little bit on the outskirts. And so he was kind of my captive audience. Mm -hmm. And um, we were very, very close. And I spent a lot of time with him. And um, then one day when I was 10 years old, we were sitting out on the front porch swing, as we often did, and I was cuddled up next to him like I often was. Um, but this particular day, he began touching my breast, and I didn't really think he knew what he was doing. Like, I just at first thought, oh, it's just a mistake. He just didn't realize and started to kind of wiggle and try to move. But he gripped a hold of me uh, and held me there and... And so that was really the beginning of the, the abuse. And it's likely there were things that happened earlier, but that I just don't have full recall. So I usually just mark it at age 10. Um, one thing we know about trauma is that it impacts memory. And so that's one of the things that in my, in my journey, I've come to really do a lot of work around is the neuroscience of trauma. And that's really helped me to put into context much of my experience. And, and, you know, this moment of trauma really, it really is a turning point in anyone's life. It's, there's a boy before and an after. And, um, you know, I was really struggling and the, the abuse escalated until one day my mom happened to see him touching me and she and my dad responded very greatly. They got him immediately out of the house. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. And I really honor them for that because I've heard many, many stories in the 14 years that I've been working with survivors of sexual trauma where that's not been the case, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was, I struggled, you know, I, they tried to get me into counseling, but I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> I was like, no, yeah. thank you. <laughs> like, I just want to pretend that everything's okay. And um, so throughout my teens, I was really sitting with all that trauma and, and not doing anything with it other than being impacted by it. Um, and then along the way, I did some counseling and therapy and started to make a little bit more sense of what was going on for me. And um, and then I was uh, around the age of 18, I started dating someone and then we were together for 10 years, married for three. And that relationship was really quite abusive. And so... I was trying to manage and heal childhood trauma while being traumatized. And all of that was impacting like my capacity to use my voice, to speak up for myself, to set boundaries. And we'll get more into that, I'm sure, as we go along here today. But when we divorced, that was really another turning point in my life. I, I found myself really sitting with everything that had happened and, and really feeling afraid, quite honestly, about my future. Like if I keep going, the way I've been going, this is not looking good. <laughs> this is not yeah. Looking good. yeah. And so I just became very, very committed to trying to answer that question. Like, how do I heal? 
from sexual abuse. And so I began reading everything I could. Um, I eventually did my master's in counseling psychology, studied neuroscience, and was really just using myself as a guinea pig, like, okay, what works and what shifts and how do I do that? And what do I need to heal in order to live more empowered and have healthier relationships? And so all of that eventually became what is now the Beyond Surviving program. And then that's the work that I, I do every day with people all over the country, all over the world, um, mm-hmm. taking them through that step-by-step process. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, I can't imagine what you went through for all of those years. And I know that there are viewers out there who are going through or have gone through the same thing you did. So thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. and letting them know that they're not alone. Not at all. Yeah. You're welcome. Um you know, so one question that I have, is it, it unusual when a person has been a victim of childhood abuse, like you were, to get into abusive relationships as adults? Mm, not unusual at all, unfortunately, um, without intervention. I'll say it that way. So if you, it's not a mm, guarantee But if you have unresolved trauma and if the, you know, what is happening in the context of abuse is we know that 90%, like right around that percentile of abuse happens within the family. And so it's somebody, you know, it's a trusted adult. It's a family member usually. And so abuse is happening within the context of relationship. And so especially when abuse is happening when you're young and you have no context for what's healthy, what's safe, what's okay, what's not okay, then all of your kind of framework for how to relate and be in relationship is informed and influenced by those experiences. And so, you know, some of the common messages that um, or beliefs that survivors of sexual trauma develop are things like I'm here to be used. Wow. I'm here as an object to be taken advantage of. Uh, The silencing that happens are because of abuse, you know, then like my voice doesn't matter. My needs don't matter. What I want doesn't matter. Uh, And so all of that. um, And of course, it's a complete violation of a boundary. right? Right. And so all of that just adds up to us then in our adult lives when we're trying to go out and form relationship, we don't have frameworks that help us do that in a healthy way. You know, oftentimes people have this idea, well, I'm just supposed to know how to be in a healthy relationship. I'm just supposed to know how to determine if somebody is trustworthy or not. But all of these are actually skills that if we had better models or we weren't distracted by dealing with all the effects of trauma that we would have been picking up along the way to support us in developing healthy adult relationships. But when we're lacking that toolkit, then we are just at very high risk. We're not attracting abusers. We're not like calling them in. I really don't believe that. It's really just a matter of we don't have the skills and tools to kind of filter very well people And so, you know, we find ourselves and and that's certainly what happened to me. You know, I was desperate for love. That's the other part, right? We're desperate Uh, for love. We're desperate to feel good enough, to feel worthy, to feel wanted. And so sometimes it's like anybody that turns their head our way, it's like, okay, you know, we wrap ourselves up in that really very quickly. And even when there are very clear warning signs, um, we don't necessarily step away. Our risk meters are kind of broken. Got it. Okay. So um, speaking of warning signs, could you just name a few of those warning signs? Mm, uh, yeah. to, those might kind of make some bells go off for people who are listening, I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, so, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about with my clients is learning how to assess whether somebody else has a capacity to attune to your needs. So the first thing that, that, that we have to be able to do to even assess for that is to be able to communicate our needs. Um, But I'll give an example. So one of the tools we talk about in Beyond Surviving is making clear requests. And so Mm -hmm. let's say you go, you're dating someone and you go and say, hey, I'm really struggling with something today. And I could really just like, I'd love to talk for like 10 minutes about that. And could you just give me a hug and then tell me I can handle it? You know, like that kind of clear in-depth communication where you're actually understanding, oh, I can tell people 
what to say, ah, <laughs> you know? yeah. like yeah. what to do, what I really actually need, not trying to like make them guess or figure it out. But in the space of having made that kind of request, let's say I do that. And then at the end of my share, my partner turns around and says, well, you know what I would do if I were in that situation um, and like completely bypasses what yeah. I've said and what I've asked for. That's a red flag. Got it. Because that's really showing me, uh oh, this person isn't able to set aside their own agenda, right? Or what they think I need and attune to what I need. Yes. Yeah. So that's one real clear example. I mean, I think certainly things that like pacing of relationship, um, understanding like when somebody's really, really kind of like trying to pull you in super, super, super fast. And that can be, um, that, that that's not necessarily a, a numbers thing. It's more about an energy thing and like mm -hmm. the type and form of relationship that you have. So for example, with my current partner, we moved in together after two months, which is like, whoa, completely outside of like my world most of the yeah. time. Um, but there was just, the, there was such alignment and such good like energy there. I was like, okay, this is a risk. That risk assessment piece is so, so important. Ah, okay. And like, here's the risk. Here's the risk that I'm willing to take. Here's how I'm going to take care of myself if things go sideways. Um, like all of those pieces. And, you know, we've been together now for seven years. Wow. So we're paid off. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> right. So when I say pacing, I don't necessarily mean a numbers thing. I mean, like, is it within the space of what feels comfortable and safe for you? Or are they pushing past that boundary mm -hmm. and kind of demanding or ex experiencing? Certainly another red flag is when people try to isolate you or disconnect you from your other support systems that's a big problem too. Got it. So, okay. A, a couple of questions came to mind. First question is, is so, you know, there may be somebody out there who's watching, um, who went through a similar experience that you did and they think like, I'm totally past it. I don't have any unresolved trauma yet. They are in bad relationships after, in, after bad relationship after a bad relationship. Um, do you have anything to say about that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do How you do think I say this nicely? Okay. No, like, yeah. Like, I think that we can find that, that there is some truth to that, that you can feel very complete and resolved about the trauma itself, but resolving the trauma itself does not give you the skills and the tools that you need to have healthy relationships. Okay, so that's why in Beyond Surviving, we're really up to two different things. We're yes, working on trauma resolution, integrating the, the trauma so that we're not constantly triggered and overwhelmed by it and living through the lens of the past. But then the other side of the coin is we have to develop the skills and tools that we didn't develop in childhood because we were navigating all that trauma. And so those communication skills, those listening skills, those boundary setting skills, the internal sense of self-worth, like all of those pieces, deservingness, um, then so if you're feeling like I don't have anything to look at about the trauma, great, awesome, good for you, like all the work you've done to get to that place. And what you might be missing is your toolkit for healthy relationship. Yes. Okay. That makes complete sense to me communication in any relationship and sharing with somebody what you need. Um, you know, I think to some people that may feel really scary. I think it would feel really scary. And is that because they haven't developed the toolkit? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what it requires to be able to express ourselves to another human being is to be willing to open ourselves up to take risks. And, you know, one first step towards that is learning how to segment past and present. So when we've experienced certainly childhood trauma period, and then if we have repeated traumas, right, this messaging, this globalizing th thought of like, everyone's going to hurt me, everyone's going to harm me, people are out to take advantage of me. So being able to identify and deconstruct the belief systems that you have about other people and about mm -hmm. connection. You know, one of the lessons we do early on and beyond surviving is all around asking for support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we dig in and explore like what gets in the way of you asking for support. And you can also think about that more generally, like just communicating, opening up, 
sharing. And common things I hear are things like, well, I'm supposed to be able to do this all on my own, or I'm going to look weak, or people are going to use that information against me, right? And so we have all of these narratives sitting there about communication, about opening up that have to be addressed and resolved and kind of transformed. And then from there, the thing that most often stops people in communication is their, what I call a lack of tolerance for vulnerability. <laughs> okay, so it's like a vulnerability threshold. It's like, yeah, I can share that. Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. And then you hit this threshold and then you're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so because vulnerability sharing, it always requires risk, like every single time, no matter how long you've been in the relationship, no matter how many times you've shared something like it always has a level of risk. And so what most of us try to do is eliminate that risk. And yes. we usually have lots of crafty little strategies for that, that sometimes aren't so great or healthy. I certainly was in that camp. I was a real pro at that. <laughs> um, uh, throwing temper tantrums, being sarcastic, just completely withdrawing, picking fights, like all sorts of things. And so what we work on instead and beyond surviving is learning how to minimize and reduce risk. Ah, okay. So, and you mentioned that before risk assessment. Yeah. Um, so do you have some sort of framework or tool that you use to help people evaluate risk and decide yeah. how to jump into it or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think one of the things that's often very problematic in um, adult relationships, if you've had past trauma, regardless of the type of trauma, is fears around abandonment and fears around connection. And so what often happens is people will perpetuate cycles of abandonment because they're not looking at the risks that they're taking. So first level is just awareness can I notice and pay attention to what I'm doing? So for example, I had one client in session say, oh, Rachel, like I hear you. I get that you have like this belief that people can go on and have great healthy relationships. <laughs> she was giving me a real hard time. I loved it. She's like, but not for me, not for me. It's never going to work out. You like, I always end up hurt. Everyone always leaves me. And so I asked her to tell me a little bit more about her relationship history and Again and again, she started out by saying, so I was dating this married guy. Mm -hmm. So I was dating this married guy. So I was yeah. dating this married guy. Interesting. Yeah. And it just wasn't even registering until I said to her, so wait a second. Is it really true that all men leave you? Or is it just true that all married men leave uh, you? Yeah. And that there's a risk there that you're taking that's setting yourself up for this repetition of hurt and harm and disappointment. So with that awareness, we can then step into these other strategies where we look at something that might feel risky or vulnerable to do. And then we literally just ask ourselves the question, what can I do to minimize or reduce the risk? Mm -hmm. Quick example, like one of my clients was going to holiday where we're right around the holidays, right? Uh, yeah. we'll be on the other side of it. So, um, yeah, you know, like, oh, every year for like 10 years at this holiday family dinner, she ended up sitting next to the person who abused her. Wow. And she said, I'm sick of it. I'm just not even going to go this year. I can't handle it anymore. And but I really am going to miss out on, you know, seeing the other people that I love and I hate that he's winning kind of thing. And so I said, all right, well, let's talk about like what you can do to minimize and reduce the risk of ending up sitting next to him. And so she decided to go early to the party and take three jackets with her. And she went straight to the dining room and put those three jackets on the back of the chairs. Isn't this an amazing thing one day? Like when you put a jacket on a chair, it's just like automatically off limits. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> a wow. Social norm. Yeah, it's yeah. To her advantage. And so as people are starting to fill in for the dinner, when she saw that the person who abused her had sat down across the way for the first time in a decade, then she took the other jackets away and other people sat down next to her. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, that's like brilliant. Yeah. And what often happens is that 
particularly, we often feel like, I think a big part of my work is really, it's been my own journey and it's the work that I do is really helping people come back into their sense of empowerment and choice. Like Mm -hmm. you're not at the mercy of this circumstance or situation. So what are the options? What are the choices that you have available? Certainly not going is a choice. That is one way to minimize and reduce the risk. But also, what about this? What about this? What about this? But that isn't intuitive, right? That's right. something that we have to like, it has to be modeled, has to be like, let's talk about examples of that. It's a mindset and a framework that we have to cultivate. Um, but once we do that, then our capacity for opening up, clearer communication, better connection, just really, um, you know, it goes up and up and up. Yeah, that sounds great. That's um you know, one question that I have is that after years or decades of um, dealing with the effects of the trauma and not developing the skills, you know, a person may have a tendency to relive certain scenarios or replay these thoughts like I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, you know, my, my needs don't matter. So how do you shift that or how do you help Mm. people shift that around? And does it take another lifetime to do it? No. And that is the really, really good news. And that is something that I'm like adamantly actively always trying to communicate and get across that there's been a lot of messaging historically about traumas. Like this is how it's going to be. This is just how you're going to have to live with it. And, um, but mm, science tells us differently experience tells us differently. Um, There are factors that are at play that matter. Like one of my friends, one of my colleagues says, everyone can overcome trauma. Not everyone will. Mm. And that isn't because they aren't capable, but there are certain things that have to fall into place for a person to heal. And one of them is just access and resource, right? We have Mm. a lot of problems, particularly in the United States with access. Um, But that aside, because that could be a five hour conversation. um, (laughs) (laughs) What we know is that the, okay. So what we want to think about is that the experience of abuse, a trauma is an injury. It injures the brain and it injures the nervous system. Mm. So just think about like, if you were out and about and you, you know, knock on wood, broke a leg, you would not go, oh my gosh, I'm just going to have to live with this broken leg. (laughs) Well, that's just the way it is now. I'm going to spend my life walking around on a broken leg. No, right? It's an injury and you would repair that injury and your body will repair that injury. So with the bones, it's a little more, your body kind of just does that a little bit more on its own with some, you know, alignment. With the brain and the nervous system, there is a little bit more mindfulness, intention, focus that needs to happen. But it's the same idea. We heal the injury to the brain. We heal the injury to the nervous system. And so then as a result of that, we can break free from the symptoms that are there and present as a result of those injuries. That's really a lot of the work that I do around the neuroscience of trauma, Mm -hmm. helping people to understand what's going on in the brain, what's going on in the mind and the nervous system, and then what are the specific interventions that we can use to literally retrain the brain. And the brain is so plastic. It it will change. It is Mm -hmm. pliable. You have to be intentional. It won't do it on its own. Right. But with interventions, it will change. It will evolve. So when you say interventions, what do you mean by that? Well, in, you know, in my work, I'm probably teaching like 120 different, you know, approaches and and methods and strategies, because, you know, sometimes one strategy is going to really resonate in a moment or for a person, and then another strategy might be more useful. But we do things like, um, on kind of a cognitive behavioral level, just very simple reframing of experience. So one of the first tools that I teach is just called positive opposites. And it's like when that autopilot thought, because that's what the symptom of trauma is. You have autopilot thinking. Mm -hmm. Your brain has just been trained to always go. Like if you were told growing up again and again, again, you're worthless, Mm -hmm. or you experience things that communicated that you were worthless, then that is an autopilot thought. It's just there and automatic. And so maybe you're out dating and the person is like 10 minutes late and your thought goes immediately, I'm worthless. 
but he's not going to come. She's not going to come. You know, there, here, here we are again. Nobody's ever going to love me. So in those moments, learning how to check that, how to pause and how to just simply use a positive opposite. I'm lovable. Everything's going to be fine. In the beginning, you don't necessarily believe the positive opposites. It's really just about cutting off that autopilot thinking. And what's important about that is neurologically, whenever we have a thought, we're activating very specific neuronal pathways. And whenever we activate a neuronal pathway, we're telling the brain, hold on to that. That's important. We need that. Mm -hmm. That's why there are things that we remember because we access them all the time, right? Like our name and our birthday and mm -hmm. these sorts of things. My favorite pie. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> all yeah. right. but if we stop accessing that information, then and lighting up that neuronal pathway, when we sleep, the brain does a little scan and it says anything not used for a while, get rid of it. Don't need it. Delete it. Yep. That's why I cannot remember, right? Like my address from when I was a kid, right? Like I haven't touched that. I haven't used that. I haven't accessed that. So it's gone. Poof. Bye. Wow. Wow. And so it's the same thing with these kinds of dialogues or messages or ideas about self. Yeah. 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 That's, um, I, you know, it's fascinating to me, the science behind this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know much about it. I've done a little bit of reading of Dr. Joe Dispenza's work. Oh, sure. And, you know, I know he delves into it, but it's, it's fascinating to me about this rebuilding the neural pathways and, you know, how people can change their lives, change things, you know, change relationships, change the way of being by rebuilding these pathways. But it does sound like it does require a lot of awareness, you know, and is yeah. I sometimes yeah. describe it as like, just like if I wanted to get my body strong, like if I set an intention of like, I'm going to, you know, get six pack abs, <laughs> then I would not be able to just do like six sit ups, one for each ab, and then be like, okay, I'm done. And then wait, yeah. a second, like, oh, that didn't work. That didn't make any difference. That's a waste of time. That's bullshit. That doesn't, you know, so it is, I like retrain the brain. It's like doing little sit ups for the brain. Okay. And using your, just like you use a dumbbell, right. To like weight lift, you know, then it's like, there are interventions and strategies that are like that. It's like the right tool, the right weight, the right approach that helps you exercise the mind, heal the nervous system. Exactly like that. I love hearing that you have a bunch of different tools to help, help mm -hmm. people with this. I mean, you know, um, cause one thing that I've experienced, and I'm not a survivor of, of childhood abuse, but I just know that, you know, in years past, I had a, a low self-esteem. I'm not mm. sure why, but I would replay thoughts, like some of the thoughts that, you know, you were describing, I'm not good enough or whatever, you know, he's going to leave me. And at some point I thought, why am I thinking that? And I would just go to the opposite, you know, and mm. after long enough, the other stuff never came up. So you know, that resonates a lot with me, but it's exciting to know that there's a lot more because I think it's easy um, or it's not so easy for people who are so entrenched in way, one way of thinking to go to yeah. the opposite, or at least that's what my experience was. It took a lot of awareness and work on my part, yeah. um, you know, and I'm wondering, like, so what are your ideas on helping people be more mindful or be more aware of the thoughts that they're feeding themselves? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the simplest, easiest questions to ask yourself when you're having any thought, where did that come from? Mm. Think about origin. Where did I get that from? Whose voice is that really? Wow. Interesting. Really interesting. That's amazing. So I, I love this work that you're doing. And so what would you say the goal is, or, you know, uh, for the, the childhood abuse victim, like where can they see themselves or what, what is possible for them mm -hmm. in terms of relationships, Limitless. life? <laughs> <laughs> Limitless. You know, I really think that, um, first of all, understanding kind of the framework of healing. So that's one of the resources um, that I'll share with you all today is my three stages of recovery checklist. 
Um, that's rachelgrantcoaching.com slash checklist. And what you'll see in that is the information about what I think of as the three stages. So victim, survivor, and what I call beyond surviving. Mm -hmm. And first of all, just understanding where you are in your healing journey. What are the goals and intentions based on what stage you're in? What are the best interventions and types of support to get at that level of, of healing? And it's not necessarily like a straight line. Like you can be in one, you know, victimy area around one thing and you can be more in like the beyond surviving area in another. But on the whole, it'll give you a framework for understanding. And when you have that framework and you work through it in that kind of structure, then the outcomes are limitless. They really are. You know, I had one of my clients when he started was like, I just want to skip the relationship section. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm over it, I'm done. Like I'm just destined to be single. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, well, let's cross that bridge when we get there. So we did the other work. Like that's one of the things about Beyond Surviving. It's a very specific step by step program. Like I've really thought about what we need to do when, in order to maximize healing and minimize re-traumatization. And so we got to the work around relationship and trust and intimacy and vulnerability and all that. And he's now married and has a two year old son like that's awesome what yeah. like there's yeah. a whole other human being in this world now yeah i <laughs> just got chills hearing right? that yeah <laughs> i mean and yeah. so there's that everything like oh i've really been wanting to start this business forever and i keep dragging my feet and i don't think i'm good enough and i can't do it to i'm running that business i'm doing yeah. that yeah. right so i've seen so many different outcomes and people just really you know for me the the ultimate goal here, the heart and soul of the work I do is I just want people to live a life they love mm. and to have these experiences be a part of the tapestry that is their life and understand it and contextualize it and integrate that narrative, but not have it be like, this is where the, the spotlight is all day, every day, and not always be living, living through the lens, you know, of the past. And so, and I, I think we are, you know, extremely powerful when, you know, we have encouragement, support, and appropriate tools to support us with that. I really think we are limitless. Uh, well, I can tell that you're a fantastic coach, like, and uh, anybody that is going through an experience and they think that Rachel can help her or him, you know, uh, or help you, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, reach out, please reach out to Rachel. So Rachel, yeah. you know, tell us a little more about how people can find you. And if you just want to share a little more about your, you know, your signature program, I think that would be great. Okay. Yeah. So, um, there, there are a couple of resources. I already mentioned the checklist. Mm -hmm. You can certainly just generally go to the website, rachelgrantcoaching.com, check out things there. And then based on our conversation today, there, there are two resources also that I think to highlight, if you go to rachelgrantcoaching.com slash shop, you'll see um, a link there for my how to set boundaries and communicate with ease masterclass. So that's a training that you can download. It's on a sliding scale and you can listen to that and get even more um, information about the clear request strategy that we touched base on today and just some other great tools for communication and setting boundaries. Um, and then if you want to dive deeper and get more into some of the work we've talked about today around like retraining the, the brain and healing the nervous system, then my 28 day boot camp for the brain mm. program is really great for that. And it's also offered on a scholarship pay what you can um, basis with a minimum investment of 35 and you get all oh. sorts of like amazing, really great resources and tools there. So that's rachelgrantcoaching.com slash bootcamp. Um, and so, yeah, you can go check that out. And of course, if you just have any other questions or want to touch base, I'm here as a resource. You can email me anytime. Oh, lovely. I mean, you know, I think like the, those are no brainers. It sounds like to me, and especially for a lot of the people who follow command the courtroom, um, I know that they are trying to co-parent, um, or getting into or getting out of relationships where they're going to have to co-parent with an ex-partner. Sometimes mm -hmm. that partner has been abusive. Um, you know, and 
people need help with their communication, with their boundaries, with their yeah. request making. And it just sounds invaluable to me. I mean, for a minimum of an investment of $35, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. Probably anybody could use this. Yes, totally. Oh, and you know, you just, I just thought of one other resource, uh, rachelgrantcoaching.com slash resources slash parents. So if you oh, are parenting as somebody who's had trauma, then there are some great articles and resources there because sometimes we face things as parents, always, period, no matter what. Um, and then if we bring in the context of trauma there, we sometimes need some additional frameworks and resources. So also check that out. Yeah. That oh, helpful. oh, fantastic. Awesome. Wonderful, Rachel. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here with us today. Um, I loved you. having you and, and maybe Maybe we'll have you back sometime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so to all you out there watching, just um, remember to keep doing what you're doing and get out there and command the courtroom. And I'll see you next time. Have a good one.